Hello and welcome back. So in today's video, this is where you're going to find some value plays. In the previous two videos, I covered players who overperformed their five-year averages, and some of those players may be overdrafted relative to their likely production. So today we're basically discussing the opposite, players who underperform their averages for whatever reason. And just a quick recap, uh, this channel and this draft strategy is all about finding and extracting value. One way to do this is to look at players who overproduced and underproduced last year and make a reasonable guess as to why that was and try to determine who will be due for a bounce back season or a regression. Um, and in the previous videos, we were looking at regression candidates, but in this video, we'll specifically be looking for value. So if you're looking for value players, uh, if you're in a deeper league, if you're um, you know, somebody who prescribes to that notion that you need to find value in drafts as opposed to just picking the right players, then this is the video for you. So what factors are at play? Um, we're looking at the same data set as the last couple of videos, just the other side of it where we can find bounce back candidates. And when we take a look at this data, it's clear that there are two types of players in this group, older players with less name value at this point in their careers and players with injury histories. Sometimes there's players with both factors, which does add risk, but depending on where you can draft these guys, they still may provide value for you in your draft. So again, this is the same data set. It's just the other side of it. It's a five year point per game average compared with the player's last year point per game average. And again, if the player didn't play all the last five seasons, their average was calculated from what we had uh, available. So two years, three years, whatever it was, most of these players on this list had uh, at least five years of data to perform the analysis. So as we look at the chart, go to buy low forwards, and there's a couple of uh, you know things to notice right off the bat. So Jack Eichel and Mark Stone, those are the first two guys that you look at on the board. And as you can see here, anybody higher up on this list is more primed for a bounce back season just because they were severely underperforming their five-year average. As you go further down, these guys like Connor McDavid, I mean, I don't even wanna discuss him seeing as how he was just a shade under his five-year point per game of 1.54, which is absolutely insane. But some of these guys at the top are uh, potentially due for a bounce back. Uh, you can make the call yourself if some of these guys are over the hill and maybe trending downward, but we'll go into the data and we'll look at each file case by case. So with Jack Eichel, if you look at his five-year history, 0.95 points per game, 1.06, 1.14, 0.857, and 0.735. So he's trended down uh, over the last three years. Obviously, he was injured for some of that time and the whole trade saga that accompanied most of the hockey media last year. Um, there was you know, a lot of factors that contributed to that decrease in production. And then on top of that, when he finally did get to play for Vegas, he played most of the season with a broken thumb, which impacted his numbers as well. Um, you know, so he was one of those guys that, um, you know, full disclosure, I ended up drafting in all three of my leagues. I didn't necessarily plan to do that. But just seeing where he went, he usually went in like the 80 range and he was better than any other player in that range. So I decided to just stash him on the IR and hope that he could help me during playoff time. Unfortunately, he broke his thumb. But even though he did that, he was still averaging 3.9 shots per game, which is very, very good. And oftentimes he would hit 7 to 10 shots in a single game with a broken thumb. So I'd imagine uh, a normal, healthy Jack Eichel would turn all of that shooting into more offensive production, whether it's goals or points. Um, and last year, his goal per game numbers were still solid at 0.41 goals per game, which is a little bit above a 30 goal pace. So his last five seasons for goals per game, 0 0.37, 0 0.36, 0 0.52, 0 0.09, and a 0 0.41. So other than that 0 0.09 season, and I think that was uh, the year that he finally did succumb to that, that neck injury. So he was playing through it for a while and then uh, finally decided to get the surgery. Um, but in addition to all of this, you know, a lot of that production was with Buffalo without much support. And hopefully this year he's playing with a healthy Mark Stone on his wing. Um, and even if he doesn't, he's shown the ability to not only drive his own line, but at his best, he can be a heart trophy type of player without much support. So, uh, he's, you know, one of those guys, if you look at, um, his point per game average 0.73 last year, I can't see him putting up less than that this year, uh, or even coming close to that. I think he's definitely uh, a minimum 0.95 point per game guy. And he's a little bit goal heavy. 
um, probably at least a 30 goal, uh, maybe 75, 80 point guy. Uh, that would be his floor, in my opinion, um, just given the, the data and the fact that he's now finally healthy. And this kind of goes back to what I was saying before. You don't necessarily get a guy right after he's been traded or right after he goes to a new team. You wait for him to settle in a little bit, pick him up next year, because then he's had a little bit of time to adjust and acclimate to his new surroundings, find some chemistry with some players, and that's what sets up for a big, deep value play. I'm not going to necessarily guarantee that Eichel's a, a guaranteed, uh, you know, excellent pick wherever you get him. Um, but if he drops past the third or fourth round, then that's a guy I would definitely look at for deep value. Um, even though it's not that deep, you're looking in the third or fourth round. But he's a guy that could have, you know, in the past been picked in the first round. Um, and if you can get him in the third or fourth, that's where you'd like to get him. As far as his teammate and potential line mate, Mark Stone, um, he's expected to be healthy at the start of the season. He had a successful lumbar disectomy surgery back in May. And back surgeries are no joke. And it's a bit concerning that the Golden Knights' best two players have both had back surgeries in the last 12 months. But when healthy, both players are above a point per game average. So in the last five years, 1.06 points per game, 0 0.94, 0 0.96, 1 1.1, and a 0 0.81. So he's usually right around a point per game. And obviously last year he wasn't healthy and still managed a decent amount of points per game. Um, where his injury product, where his injury hurt him was his goal production. Usually he's in the 20 range. He, last year he had about nine goals and his goals per game dropped from the mid .30 range to about .24 goals per game. So he's definitely a guy to target as he, he usually averages around 20 points on the power play per season, which is usually what you'd want to get in a forward. And last year he was around 1.9 shots per game. Um, but in the past, he's been 2.27, 2.5, 2.5, 1.78, 1.91. 1 so he does get decent category coverage, uh, and he does put up shots. So obviously, everything kind of depends on both of these players' health. Um, I would expect Jack Eichel to be a little bit healthier than Mark Stone, seeing as how his surgery came um, about a year ago at this point, and his thumb should have healed by now. Um, Mark Stone, there is some risk baked in there just because of that back surgery. That's always a tricky situation. Um, but if you want, if he drops in your draft and you can see him pass the third or fourth round, he might be value in that range. Again, you don't want to reach with these guys. These are not necessarily guys that you want to take a stab at in the top you know, two rounds or, or anything crazy like that. You want to wait for them to drop, and they probably will because most players who are looking at their their fantasy dashboard as they're trying to make their picks, they're looking at last year's stats. And so Eichel and Stone are not going to have great stats from last season, or they're going to be looking at the projections from Yahoo or ESPN or whatever. Um, so they might have them a little bit higher, but it just depends on how these guys pan out in your league in the draft. Um, the next guy on this list, Taylor Hall, he's usually a 0 .90 point per game average guy. Last year, he was 0.75, so a little bit below that. Um, what happened last year, he, you know, his 0.75 point per game, it seems like a dip, but it kind of stopped a four-year downward trend, which isn't necessarily exciting. So he had 1.22 points per game, 1.12, then a 0.8, then a 0.62, and then finally bumped up with a 0.75. So he was sliding downwards, and that's kind of why... Um, I never really have been high on him uh, because I've seen this regression in his in his production every single year. And then on top of that, he's not necessarily uh, a massive goal scorer. He does score goals. Um, but, you know, for my taste and the way his production was trending, it didn't look good. But uh, last year he started slow, but then uh, towards the back end of the season, he scored 47 points in 55 games. Um, and that was probably coinciding with the fact that he got teamed up with David Pasternak and Eric Halla. Um, this year, he's either going to have uh, Bergeron as, as his center or Krejci, who's back. Uh, and he may or may not end up with Pasternak. So um, if he's with both of them, that sets up really well for Taylor Hall. If he's just with Krejci, the last time Hall played with Krejci, he put up 14 points in 16 regular season games. So he could provide value for you. Uh, it just depends on where you can get him. Usually, um, you can get him in the 90 to 100 range. So if he is there, um, again, I normally wouldn't have thought of him as a guy to go pick up, but that could be value um, if he's still in that range. The next guy on this list, Ryan O'Reilly. Um, 
I'm not really sure what happened here in terms of his production. All I can say is there's a little bit of a pattern to his production over the last couple of years. So if you look back five years, 0.75 points per game, 0.93, 0.85, 0.96 and then 0.74 so it appears that he usually goes up and down up and down every season um, which does bode well considering last year he put up a 0.74 so if you're just looking at that pattern he's probably going to be back above a 0.9 point per game um, but it is a little bit difficult to understand considering how good the Blues offense was last year especially compared to some of their other teams even when they won the cup they didn't have the kind of offense that they had last year um, and he's got a ton of players to work with. Um, the only thing that that may have caused that was maybe a drop in ice time because of how stacked they were in their top nine. And that's not really going to change. St. Louis has pretty much stayed the same in the offseason. So that could be a good and a bad thing for Ryan O'Reilly because he does have the tools to work with. Um, the wingers are there that could potentially drive production as well. But at the same time, he had all of that last year and maybe his ice time decreased a little bit and he underperformed his usual averages um, just something to keep an eye on um, he's not necessarily a guy I would reach for or target that early and I typically do think that there are better point producers out there who are centers um, but if you do want to go the O'Reilly route he will get you exposure to a lot of really good players Tarasenko, Buchnevich, a number of others uh, you know Cairo, maybe Thomas um, you know depending on how they they structure their lines this year that could be a decent pickup for value and then obviously Brad Marchand. Um, let's look at Marchand and Bergeron both because a lot of this is similar. Um, they both probably lost a bit of their production when Bruce Cassidy broke up the perfection line and added Pasternak with Halla and Hall to balance out that scoring. Um, and then on top of this, you know, there were some distractions last year. Marchand wanted to play in the Olympics and kind of was going back and forth with the league. And then he's since had off-season hip surgery and will be out till November. So that's going to hopefully make him drop in your fantasy draft um, but everyone knows how good he is how valuable left wing production is so he likely won't fall that far um, mainly because he averages about 1.24 points per game if you look at his five-year average so he still even though he underperformed a little bit last year and was dealing with a couple of injuries in that hip he still put up 1.14 points per game which is really good and then on top of that his average is above that so um and then on top of that, he's got Bergeron back for another year. They just added Krejci back, so their top six is looking more like what it did when they went to the finals in 19 than it did last year when they were kind of, um, they had a gaping hole down the middle that Eric Halla kind of, you know, tried to fill and did a pretty good job there. But he's going to have more weapons to work with this year. Um, so that will definitely help Marchand. If you want to grab him and stash him on the IR, that could pay off for you in the back half of the season because, again, he's still a 1.24 point per game guy, and you can maybe get him in the third or fourth round depending on if he falls like that in your draft. He may not because people know how good he is. Um, with Bergeron, he's basically a point per game center, and he gets exposure to Pasternak and Marchand, which is a gold mine for fantasy. So he can usually be had in the fifth or sixth round, which could provide a decent amount of value for your team. Um, but, you know, his slight decrease in production could have something to do with the fact that he's relatively unable to stay healthy for a full 82 game season. Um, or it just could be the, the breaking up of the perfection line. Um, that line with both of them uh, definitely drives up uh, Bergeron's production. But he's, you know, usually around 0.97, which is hovering right around a point per game average and he is a center um, he will get you um, a couple of hits couple of blocks nothing crazy but um, obviously a very well-rounded two-way guy so if you're in a plus minus league he's probably going to drive uh, a lot of plus numbers uh, in that category coverage as well if you look down right below him Evgeny Malkin he is a guy that he's you know got that name value from the past but people are kind of discounting him thinking he's older and he's still a 1.1 point per game player. Uh, and that's just that's not just regular season, that's playoffs as well. He's still above a point per game average in the playoffs or around a point per game. Um, so he's he does have trouble staying healthy. Um, he has missed a bunch of games over the past number of seasons, but he still averages 1.1 points per game when he is healthy. On top of that, he's pretty goal heavy. If you look at his last five seasons, goal per game numbers, 0.53, 0.30, 0 0.45, 0 0.24, 0 0.48. So just uh, to, to keep in mind, you know, anything above a 0.5 is a 40 goal pace. 
uh, and anything above a .4 is roughly around a 30 goal pace. So you're looking at a 30 to 40 goal guy still, um, and he's going to put up uh, you know over 80 points in a regular season where he's healthy. Um, he may not be healthy, but even if he doesn't stay healthy, that gives you some flexibility. You can put him on the IR and pick somebody up uh, that will get you through to the playoffs. And then in the playoffs, if he's healthy, he's going to perform like a top elite level player and you may be able to get him deeper in your draft so that's where you could potentially mine some value out of a file like that and then in the same vein if you look at Claude Giroux um, another older player with some older name value um, and last year his underperformance may be due to the Flyers struggles uh, or could just be that he changed teams for the first time in his career and didn't feel as comfortable in Florida uh, but he usually averages 0.94 points per game. He was a little bit below that last season. Um, and if you look at the last five seasons, 1.24, 1.03, 0.76, 0 0.79, and a 0.86. So he dropped for a couple years there at the beginning. And then in the last three years, he's trended up um, over the past three years, although yeah, kind of marginally, not a crazy jump, but he's still productive. On top of that, he's been one of the best power play producers in that same time span. Uh, he averages about 0.3 points per power play points per game, or around 23 uh, power play points per season. So he does have a lot of power play value, and he's now going to a very good Ottawa top six with plenty of difference makers to find chemistry with. Um, I could definitely see him playing with DeBrinket or Stutzla. Uh, if he's not going to be playing with them, it might be Batherson and Kachuk. It just depends on what they want to do in their top six, but he's going to have exposure to some pretty talented wingers, uh, and that power play is probably going to be very improved. Thomas Shabbat on the back end, Giroux up front, Debrinket, Stutzla, Kachuk maybe in front as the, uh, the the net front guy. There could be a lot of fantasy value in that file, um, and this is the theme. You can see a lot of this. Older players or older names, not necessarily you know, 40-year-old players, but you're looking at older players uh, with that name value where you can potentially mine some of that value yourself and get a Bergeron or a Malkin or a Giroux really late in the draft. Um, and if you can do that, that will set you up nicely uh, for your team if you're trying to maximize value and uh, not necessarily overdraft players. This is the list that you want to be looking at. And again, you can find this and all of my charts and graphs in the description below and play with it yourself. So the next name on this, Blake Wheeler, in the mock draft video um, that I did where I was covering the owner, owner's box mock draft from last year, uh, one of the hosts, Drew, had picked Wheeler, and I kind of scoffed at that pick a little bit. But looking into the data, it wasn't quite as bad as I originally thought. So uh, he averages uh, around what he put up last year, which is a .92. So if you look at his five-year average, it's a .99. That's because uh, the first two years of this uh, five-year average, 1.12, 1.1 point per game average, but then at 0 0.91, 0 0.92, 0.92. So he's probably now a player who will hover around that 0.9 number, uh, which is pretty good. Um, but he's losing his name value every day as the Jets remain relatively stagnant and he gets a year older. Um, and if you see his name late there, it may be worth a pickup, especially if he's going to play with Kyle Connor or Nick Ehlers in the top six, which is likely. Um, but the only problem with that is he is fairly assist heavy, uh, but does shoot. He gets about 2.5 shots per game and about 0 0.30 power play points per game, which is somewhere in the, the low 20 range. So he could be valuable there. Um, you're just not going to get a lot of goals. Um, speaking of not getting a lot of goals, uh, Jacob Voracek, he's very assist heavy, but his five-year point per game average is still pretty high at a .85. Um, and now he's, <clears throat> I don't think he's necessarily going to be playing with Goudreau and Line, but there is more offensive support there. Uh, maybe he factors in playing with Kent Johnson or some, one of their other younger players. Um, you know, Texier, I believe, is out for the season. Uh, so Voracek might have to fill a little bit more of an offensive production role uh, with the Columbus Blue Jackets, and he will more than likely still get power play time, um, whether it's on the first unit or the second unit. Could be a little bit of a, a deep value play there. Kopitar is relatively consistent, so you're in the range now, uh, this level, where it's not that much of an underproduction to, to necessarily be statistically relevant. Um, Kopitar's around a 0 .8, 0 .85, 0 .89 point per game player. Um, if you look at Pasternak again, 
that file kind of matches with what we said about Bergeron and Marchand. Um, if he's playing with those two, his production's going to be higher. If he's not playing with those two, he's still a point per game guy, uh, regardless. Um, Braden Point, he's one of those guys that gets drafted relatively high every season um, and doesn't necessarily provide you value because of that. But if you can find him a little bit deeper in the draft, this could be a great year to to pick him up because he's now um, everything is set. He's got his contract. He's he's settled in in that Tampa Bay offense. He's going to get the number one power play time in that bumper spot, and he does score a lot from that spot uh, on the power play. Hopefully, his running mate Nikita Kucherov will stay healthy all season, and if he does, that could work out really well for Braden Point. But just don't overdraft him because he usually does go in the second round. Uh, and that's not necessarily where I'd see him, considering that he's, his five-year point-per-game average is .93. Um, and you can definitely find better centers, even in this list, .94 for Giroux, and he's not going to be a second-round or second round pick. Uh, Malkin's way over that, and he's not going to be a second-round pick. So don't pick Braden Point in the second round, um, but if you can get him a little bit later, he does have the potential to overproduce that, that five-year point-per-game average number. As far as Matt Barzell goes, there's nothing in the data that suggests that he's going to pop off, but um, he's been in the league for a while now. You can see it with the eye test, and now he's got Lane Lambert as the coach, and my hunch is they fired Barry Trotz because he wasn't unleashing their younger players, including Barzell, offensively. They were playing too much defense, um, which did, you know, did help them out. They obviously went to the conference finals and were one game away from winning the cup or going to the cup. Uh, they probably would have beaten Montreal, but we don't know for sure. Um, but Matt Barzell, he's never been that that over a point per game guy in the regular season. Um, but if there's ever a year for him to maybe you know look at increasing that production, it would probably be this year, considering he's got a new coach um, and he's still relatively familiar with a lot of his line mates. And some of those line mates are now bona fide 30, 35 goal guys like Anders Lee. Brock Nelson is not necessarily a line mate, but he's uh, he's in that 30, 35 goal range. Um, Beauvillier, when he gets hot, he has that pace, but he doesn't necessarily stay at that 30 goal pace. Uh, he is a little bit inconsistent, but he could be a deeper value play. He just always gets overdrafted. That's the problem that I have with Barzell. He's, for me, he's not really a fifth or a sixth round guy. He's more of a ninth, 10th, 11th round guy if you're going to go that route. Um, but he usually gets overdrafted because people see how fast he is on the ice and the eye test kind of shows that he should be drafted a little bit higher. Um, as far as the other guys on this list, again, we're in that range where this isn't really statistically relevant. Um, you know, a lot of these guys put up really good seasons nonetheless. Um, Tavares, I do think of him as, you know, maybe going a little bit in the opposite direction, but um, just the eye test on the foot speed is kind of what's making me think that. If you look at the production, he's still, I mean, look at that, 0 0.96, 0 0.98, right in that range. And on top of that, Toronto is one of the best offenses in the league. They were number two in the league last year, and he's in their top six, and he does get some power play time. So, you know, obviously he gets a lot of name value, so he may be overdrafted. Um, but if he drops, he could be a good value play. Again, these guys at the bottom are not your, your really big value plays. You want to look at the top of this list, for your bigger value plays. But um, either way, this is what you want to be looking at. And as we mentioned in the previous video, the overdraft video, not all of these these players are overdraft candidates. Uh, a lot of these younger guys are, you know, potentially able to, to follow this up. Um, you know, I'm looking at maybe Jack Hughes, maybe Troy Terry, Drake Batherson. Um, some of these guys have a lot of potential baked into their file. Uh, and not all of these guys are overdraft candidates. So you can pick some value off of this list as well. And obviously this list was much lar uh, larger, so I didn't cover a lot of these names. But, uh, you know, a guy like Nico Heischer in the top six in New Jersey is going to get a, a lot of time. Uh, he could be a good deep play. Uh, I, I've always liked Brian Rust, especially for his goal totals. Uh, but he did overproduce a little bit last year. So you can find value on both of these lists and you can find um, these graphs in the description below. I'll li link everything down below. So you can play around with these yourself and uh, kind of determine for you what works with your strategy. 
But I want to thank you again for paying attention. Um, you know, make sure to like and subscribe this video if you liked it. Get, leave me a comment if you have any uh, specific questions you want answered in some of the, the future videos or any specific styles you want the future videos to be in. Anything I can do to try to help you guys uh, maximize value and win your fantasy leagues, uh, that's what I'm looking to do. So thanks again, and I'll see you in the next one.